Hey everybody, this uh, this week we are with uh, Derek Shields and we are on board his beautiful yacht, Sagan. And uh, welcome on to the podcast, Derek. Well, thank you. Uh, <laughs> it's a bit of a surprise to be here, I've got to say, but um, yeah. Uh, Great. See how we go. And uh, whereabouts are we? Uh, we're up the, the Gordon River at Sir John Falls, which is... Um, the site of uh, the Franklin blockade uh, back in the 80s when the, the hydro wanted to dam half of the southwest of Tasmania and there was a major fight led by Bob Brown to um, yeah to stop the dam and and uh, keep the rivers flowing free. So uh, yeah, last time I was here, this this place was full of bulldozers and wow. And uh, pile drivers and police and hydro workers and protesters and things. So it was a, a very noisy, very different place and a peaceful. Yeah, you know, so it's quite a yeah. quite a significant location history wise. And I mean, mm-hmm. how many people how many people were involved in that that, that thousands. process of protest? Thousands. I think it was fourteen hundred were arrested. Wow. You know, uh, along with many who weren't and support crews and and so on. It was. Uh, yeah, it was the protests were sort of based in Strawn. The actual um, blockade was based in Strawn with an upriver camp at Butler's Island, mm-hmm. and um, and the local Strawn um, Reg Morrison in the JLEM carried people backwards and forwards to um, to you know participate and whatever. And uh, yeah, yeah. So anyhow, it was a it was a big fight. It was. Um, but we won in the long run. Bob uh, Hawk, when long... Bob Hawke got elected, he uh, he passed, or the Labor government then passed laws that this was designated a World Heritage Area, yeah. yet they were still going to dam it. And right. the Commonwealth had the power, the Commonwealth exercised its power to say, no, no, you can't dam a World Heritage Area. And then there was a High Court challenge and all that sort of stuff. But right. in the finish... You know, um, this dam didn't happen. Others wow, didn't. people power. Bob mm. Hawke got elected as Prime Minister and then yep. Yep. he came in and stopped it. Yep. And yep. here we are yep. in this yep. amazing setting. Yep. Otherwise, it would be a big industrial zone here. Wow. Yeah. Well, what, a, what a, I mean, yep. we share yeah. the photos on Facebook, but it's just such a stunning location. It would be a shame to, to commercialise it or industrialise it anyway, really. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. Hence yeah. why it's a World Heritage yeah. location. Yeah. But also everything upstream it would be flooded. I mean, there are still dams that flood huge sections but of, yeah. the, of the Gordon and, and so on, but the Franklin at least is uh, is undammed. Yeah. And uh, is magic as the, the crew will find out. Yeah, we're yeah. heading up there mm-hmm. for a little couple mm-hmm. of little trips in the rib today. Um, so it's it's kind of iconic. I mean, so it's ironic that we that we met because uh, we... we we motored 20 miles up the Gordon River yesterday from the Macquarie Harbour on the west coast of Tasmania. And there's a rally on at the moment. I think it's 26 vessels participating in that and going around Tasmania yeah. anti-clockwise. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we assumed that when we got up here, there'll be, you know, four vessels at least rafted up on this magic little dock up here by the Sir John Falls. And uh, we got up here yesterday after a, about a three and a half hour trip up the river. Um, and we see the vessel of Sagan um, tied up on the dock, and fortunately uh, we hailed Derek, and he offered to let us raft up next to him, but we su- suggested we might squash him if, if the current was a bit adverse, so uh, he kindly offered to move and raft up next to us on a silver fern, and we had a magical evening uh, tied up. Mm. It's a beautiful, still place to spend the night, and we had so a bit, tranquil, bit yeah. of a social catch-up, and it was fun. Yeah. So I'll just correct you on the the name is Sagan, Sagan. which means the, the saga. If ah. you know, that's the that's nothing to do with Carl Sagan. Okay. It's a, <laughs> Sagan, it's a, thank you for Sagan is is the saga in in Danish. You put an N on the end of the the word to say right. the, if you like. So ah. it just means the never ending story or the ongoing, you know, mm-hmm. hopefully chapter after verse. And, and that's and, and that's why you chose that name yeah, when you built yeah, Sagan. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So. Yeah. Do you want to, I guess, take, take me back? Because this is an amazing story for this beautiful vessel. It's an mm. amazing story for how mm. she was created. Um, a lot of love and care and hard work and money they went into her um, back in the early 1980s. Um, did, did you complete it in 80, 85 or start in 85? Launched her in 85. Launched in 85. 85. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. What, so what, what, prior to 1985 and prior to the time you spent constructing her, what got you into sailing and, and what led you to the point where you decided, I'm going to build my own yacht? Oh, 
know, it's a long story. <laughs> but, I've got all day. Yeah. S- simply, I've, I've, I can remember. I grew up on on a dairy farm up in De- Victoria, and I can, can still remember the first time I actually saw the sea. It smelt the sea before I saw it. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, we're on a you know, mum and dad took us on a, a holiday down to the the sea, and and uh, ever since just seeing the horizon just go forever. Um, you know, I just fell in love with the sea, and, mm-hmm. and um, uh, then over the years, my uncle used to sail Sydney Hobart yacht races, mm-hmm. and I used to do part of the trip back with him and, and things like that. And uh, and then um, in the seventies, I headed off around the world as as you did back then. Hitch hitch you know, flew to Kuala Lumpur and hit and hitched across to England, and wow. uh, spent eighteen months on that journey and. Um, uh then I got a job on oil rigs in South America and then when I was in South America my uncle said look we're going on this cruise um and we want someone as a deckhand if you like you know uh-huh. to wait to, uh, so are you interested so I, I said yep and caught a plane all the way back and and uh, and we hopped on the boat in um Gladstone and uh, headed out and we, we spent about three nights out on the reef and then he got a phone call or got a, a message and a phone call and he had to abandon the trip because his business something had gone wrong. And right. So my job was to put the boat to sleep and so I'd come halfway around the world for a three day um, <laughs> a three day cruise. So I thought, well, bugger it, I'm going to get my own boat. Mm-hmm. And and um yeah so then i started looking for a boat that would do what i i wanted um i wanted to go everywhere so i had to go high latitudes up to um you know i wanted to go around the, the horn and i want to go to norway and all that mm-hmm. sort of stuff initially mm-hmm. so um yeah I, I hunted around for a boat that would do that and couldn't find one that i could afford that i could trust and so i looked at building a boat and then i found a um a boat builder and, and designer in Hobart called Jock Muir. He's, um, he's built and uh, several Sydney Hobart winners and so on, but also fishing boats and whatever, all designed for the Southern Ocean. Mm-hmm. So um, I found this design and uh, uh, arranged to, well, organised to build the, the boat, started the process. And um, after a I gradually, I was working and getting the, the gear together to, to actually build the boat. Um, and uh, I was trying to get the Huon Pine because it's Huon Pine, you know, designed for Huon Pine planking. And mm-hmm. it was Tas- so I wanted all the timbers to be Tasmanian, the mm-hmm. entire boat to be built from Tasmanian timber. And um, I uh, came over to Strawn and uh, to, to find someone who could sell me the Huon Pine. And I, I came down to the, the waterfront in Strawn, which is uh, the Morrison's Mill, is right on the waterfront in, in Strawn. And I asked the fellas there if they, um, well, it's an, that'd be good morning from my, my dear wife on the, the satellite. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, um, yeah, so anyhow, I, I said, look, I wanted to build this boat that designed by Jock Muir and, and whatever. And uh, he said, well, uh, come and have a look at this. So he, he took me around behind his mill and out onto this little jetty that was poking out from Strawn into the Macquarie Harbour and um, uh, said, well, will this do? And I sort of wasn't sure what he was talking about to start with and then realised that beside the, the jetty was this big log floating in the water. It was about a metre and a half diameter, something like that. It was hard wow. to see, 60 or 80 feet long. And um, uh, he said that we'd, a fishing boat had just brought it in a couple of days earlier because they'd found it floating in the in the harbour. Wow, what a massive hazard out there. Yeah, yeah. But what what the way they used to cut hue and pine was they cut it up in the, the hills mm-hmm. and then they'd skid it down the hills into the river. Mm-hmm. And some of them got stuck and didn't get in, you know, right. and, and they got hung up. And then it, and we'd had some really heavy rain and some some floods, so the flood washed this out into the harbour. And um, it had his father's stamp on the butt. So whoever cut it down, they, they'd hammer a stamp into the, their initials or whatever right. into, into the butt so that when it all got down here, they'd know whose was whose. Who'd pay who for what. Yeah. Uh, and um, Morrisons are a, a big, you know, they're 
of famous family in Strawn. So uh, once they realised it was a Morrison stamp on the, the end, there was no question of cutting the butt off or whatever and, and claiming it themselves. So the yeah. fishing boat brought it into Morrison's mill. And uh, he said, we haven't had a log this good, you know, for decades. Wow. You know, perfect boat building timber. So there's, so, so there's been cut down decades earlier, yeah, 40 not made years it to the river, least. sat yeah. there. Yeah. Eventually a flood happened, yeah. a once in 40 year flood or whatever, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> or enough to move it into the river. Yeah. And now it's floated down to Macquarie Harbour and now, now it's, now it's in yeah. straw. And, so yeah. she came past here. Wow, you know, the back back. And one and a half metres across yeah. is huge. Yeah, yeah, it's I mean, a big tens of tons yeah. probably. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Wow, mm. wow. So um, yeah, I'm not exactly. I mean, it was. It looked. That's how it looked. You know, I didn't yeah. measure it, but you know, it looked. But, but, large. but the, the thing about hue and pine is, it's it's a very lightweight timber. It's about half the density of water, mm -hmm. so half of it's out of the water, which mm. is unusual. Which is quite unusual yeah. when you think about yeah. a log. Yeah. With fifty percent of it visible, because usually we just see a little bit, yeah. like an iceberg. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and just while we're on here in pine, what are the, what are the properties that make it, fantastic for for for, for yachts to be built out of? Um, it's it's fantastic to work because it's got an oil in in it, so that it lubricates as you're planing or whatever. It's it's self lubricating if you like. It's mm -hmm. a very very easy timber to work. It's very springy and and strong in that respect, but it's not very hard. It's quite quite soft but the oil that's in it means that um, borers can't digest it they can eat it ah. but they can't digest it so you, you'll find little borer holes but they only go in about an inch and they die of starvation because right. for all their work they don't get any nourishment out of ah, it right? interesting so it doesn't rot and like literally they found well it, it does rot to some degree but it uh, the, the, the logs themselves can last thousands of years literally in the in the soil you know when you um in areas where there's some um, uh, swamp if you like mm -hmm. you, know, you can dig down and find three or four thousand year old trees wow in in the, and you can pull them up and they're the not absorbing water and, yeah. the, and the oil probably yeah. helps protect yeah, yeah. So, well. um, so the lightweight easily worked don't rot don't get eaten by insects mm -hmm. you know. but uh, that I've, I've had several bumps in this boat and and it gets compressed, but then it gradually springs back out again. Oh. So it um, uh, it's sort of got a, an elasticity to it as well. So wow! Yeah. And this Huon, and in terms of Huon pine and the environmental protection, what what controls are in place to to protect Huon pine? Well, Huon pine's one of it's a really slow growing tree. So this tree that this boat's built out of would, would have been thousands of years old. Wow! Um, and uh, You'll see them on the, the bank here, um, but what you, you see, either they're very crooked, they were no good for timber, or they're, they're very young, but um, they're, they're very, very slow growing, and there are very few big hewn pine trees left, because this is the only place in the world they grow, mm -hmm. and they were milled for, they were logged for, rather, for um, uh, oh, I guess, 100 years or something, I don't know, oh, a very so long time. They until, slayed, slayed all those big giants. Yeah, so every decent size hue and pine that was anything like useful was cut down. And distressingly, one of the things that I found that they were they used them for, they used to send them to England and so on, and they used them to make the blanks that you put your felt hat on when you take your hat off after, um, you know, if you've been wearing your nice yeah. hat or whatever, then you, you don't just put it on the thing, you put it on this cut out this mm. sort of moulded a lot of waste unbelievable <laughs> yeah. anyhow but also there are a lot of you know window sills and, and mm. doors and things like that that were exposed to the weather were made from from human mm. yeah, so. okay so so now you're you're looking mm. at this log and mm. sitting there in the harbour partially visible and partially submerged mm. and so what happened next well uh, they i had a um, a stack of stuff gradually growing at home because every time I got a paycheck, I, I bought more more stuff. I was working underground up in Ross Arden at the time in a, in a um, tin mine up there. But um, uh, so I got them, them to, to mill it uh, to the specifications in the in the plans, mm -hmm. and uh, and then deliver it to. Um, by that stage, I had a um, a friend who'd offered me the use of her land yeah. to build a shed and then put the, build the boat in. So I had it all delivered down there and then um, stacked it to let it you know, dry and, and, and so on. And 
build a shed and you know built built the boat. Wow. Mm. And um, did you have a background in building or construction at any level? And how, and, and how no, you... I've just always loved working with wood. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, it was just a. a, a the woodwork project of to beat all woodwork projects and mm. it was a freedom machine you know you, mm. once i had my own boat i could go anywhere mm. Mm. and mm. and did you work days nights weekends how did you and you know what, what, have, what sort of how did you fit that around your work and well fortunately um oh, i had a <laughs> I, I fluctuate between all sorts of different jobs i'm jack of all trades and master of none scenario but i work on oil rigs a fair bit and I did a lot of the early computing electronics IT stuff on oil rigs and um, uh, so I'd go away for four weeks and uh, to wherever and uh, and then back for four weeks right. and a four week stint yeah um, so for the first year I was still doing that um, but I wasn't getting as much of the boat built as I wanted to I could see it going too long so then I stopped working and just just stop earning money basically mm -hmm. and, and i did did some uh, just troubleshooting because I, I knew how to make all these things work but yeah um and as, and as an aside i i got an interesting chip the trip i had to uh do an emergency trip to china to beijing back in the the days long you know this is still back in the early 80s mm -hmm. and um I had to go out to an oil rig because the, this new system that had been sh shipped from France over there and uh, had broken down and, and no one could fix it. And um, when I got there, there was, there was pandemonium and everyone was carrying on about what was wrong and whatever. These are electronic computerised units that monitor everything that happens on the rig. They're like the nerve centre. Right, the, they're pretty critical. Cool. And um, yeah, when I got there, that, the whole thing was on standby because it wasn't, wasn't working. And... Uh, and they all told me all these things that they thought were wrong with it. And when I said, sort of, none of that makes sense. So anyway, I'll start with the basics. So I turned everything off and then checked the power and there was no power. So then I checked the fuse and the fuse was blown. So, <laughs> or it's a trip, you know, so, a, a, so I, a breaker, a trip. So I reset the breaker and the power came on and then I turned everything on and nothing wouldn't work. Nothing, and, so, so it all worked. Yeah, so then I turned it all off again because right. we were working for a Japanese, Chinese offshore drilling company, it was called. So there were a lot of Japanese technicians have been involved in this too and thought, oh, there's going to be huge loss, loss of, of face for if I, <laughs> I do this. So I, I spent about a week powering it up, but I never did find anything wrong with it. I just, just had to trip the fuse. Wow. So someone, <laughs> someone had been calibrating something and touched something with a screwdriver or something. Yeah, presumably, popped it. And, popped it, and that was it. You know, no one had done the shutdown. So I had this, this emergency trip over to, to Beijing and back again. Mm -hmm. So that, yeah, that helped fund the boat. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Especially when it took you, you know, more than just uh, replacing the fuse to... Well, we to, discussed it, you know. Fix it. Yeah, we, we obviously couldn't just, you know, then hop on the next flight home. Again, no, it would have been very simple. <laughs> no, so uh, so we, uh, we had to make it. More, more complicated but yeah. okay so, but you've got to go back to basics to fix things you, mm. you don't start with these assumptions you have to check yeah. anyhow that's a, no, yeah. it's a different lesson yeah, yeah. it's, in, it's mm. interesting how often mm. it's the simple things that mm. have tripped you out that you've taken for granted yeah. 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 so yeah. then you were working full-time on the construction how long did you work full-time for well i'd say the first year was half time the second year was full-time the third year was double time so wow so yeah. quite a big project really yeah, yeah in terms there's of, thousands, in terms of hours. thousands of hours go into into this so each of there are 25 planks per side mm -hmm. there are 50 ribs so there are 100 screw 100 um nails and roads in each plank mm -hmm. and so that's 5,000 nails and roads alone so each nail has to be drilled then counterboard to take the plug then yeah. you have to drive the nail you have to have a partner on the other side to put a dolly uh, on the the back and so you put the rove so that punches the row the nail through the rove mm -hmm. then you have to cut the the nail off and then you have to have the partner hop on the outside and put a dolly on the outside then you have to burr the end of the nail and so that's for and then you have to glue a plug in and plane it off to the the surface so for every single of those five thousand nails you have to do that um, alone, you know, just to give you an idea of, of um, 
the, the, the number. Who was the lucky partner involved. on the other side then? Well, this, <laughs> when I first started building the boat, I, um, I thought I was, um, I mean, my, my thinking then was I'm, I'm safe from being, you know, sort of caught up in any more romantic relationships because I was living in a shed uh, on, the, on a piece of carpet and a sleeping bag underneath the, the boat that was slowly turning up. But oh. a, a, a lady who just returned from travelling on her own in South America was visiting friends up the road and mm -hmm. yep, she turned out to be um, uh, my partner, and, yep, my wife, mother of my children. Wow. So, um, what a cool yeah, story. Yeah, so she was, she'd go teaching for the day, she was mm -hmm. a teacher, and then she'd come back and get on the dolly. I'd, I'd have one plank done, yeah. because the insides are curved to the shape of the, of the ribs, mm -hmm. the shape of the boat, and then therefore the outside has to be beveled so that you've got a wedge shape seam, so, can, so, yeah, so you can then put, fill the seams in afterwards. So, mm -hmm. so Mary would come home from school and up the ladder and inside the boat and get there with the dolly while well, I'd hammer a plank on and then she'd be outside and do the thing and we'd... Oh, what we'd a great lady, teach all day and then we yeah, work, work no, all night. She was special, yeah. oh. mm. And um, it's amazing. Mm. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, normally you'd have a, an off-sider, you know, a young lad or whatever on, on yeah. the other side. Who's quite happy to do, do commercially. Monotonous work for yeah. weeks yeah. and months on end. Yeah, yeah. But okay, yeah, yeah. and so, mm. so then, so that's... Mm. Yeah, three. Then you're working double time just wanting to get it finished. So when yeah. you go back to when you started, did did, did you have estimates of how of how long it took? I, it, I had in take? my mind it would take a year or so. Right. I had no idea. You know, yeah. As we as I went, but um, no. So I did have the support down the road of, of a famous uh, yacht building fraternity or family, the Wilson brothers. Mm -hmm. And uh, they, over generations, had built wonderful yachts in, in Signet. And in fact, the shed's still going now. Mm -hmm. But Noel and Keith, I don't I think Noel's still alive, but Keith died and whatever. But I'd go and ask them if, you know, I, I, I had a pretty good basis, but if I had any issues, I could go and talk to them. And, and they were just, I think they were just really keen to pass on the information. Mm. And they they talked to me for hours. You know, I'd eventually have to say, "Well, I've got to go." <laughs> but they'd tell me all, and they say, "Well, how are you going to do this? And have you thought about that? And whatever." So I'd come back with my head full of all these these things that I had to. Uh, uh, so yeah, so that, they were a tremendous help, and and the and the Jock Muir was also a help with all sorts of advice as well, because they built and designed and built boats. So, mm -hmm. so yeah, so. Had, People were so free with their, their knowledge. It was wonderful. Yeah. It's amazing how generous people are with their time and their their knowledge and their willingness to help you know, yeah. when it comes to sailing. Yeah, yeah there's no um, there's no feeling of oh, you know, you got to find that out for yourself. Or this is mm. I've worked so hard to get this. Yeah. It's mine. Yeah, I don't want to share with you because then yeah. you'll have an advantage over me. You know, none of that workplace yeah, competitive yeah, type of stuff. Mm, yeah. So, in terms of the construction process, what were some of the, the snags or Obstacles you had along the way that that you hadn't anticipated that you know made you stop and think, what am I going to do to solve this one? Uh, well, the whole boat was a bit like that, but uh, the what I decided to do, which was a little bit back to front from the way a lot of people build boats, was I decided that I'd do the lead first, the lead ballast, because it's underneath and bolted on from the bottom and I was thinking of the, the logistics later on of trying to put it in place afterwards. So I decided that I'd do the lead first. It's three and a half tons of lead, so it's you know it's a hefty, hefty mm. weight. So I I had an old HR Holden station wagon at the time, so I was driving everywhere finding lead and coming home sort of <laughs> with with the back of it full of, of uh window weights, you know, sash weights and all yeah. that sort of stuff and and uh eventually got the, 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 the weight of lead together and I got a couple of old cast iron baths mm -hmm. um, I made a, a wooden version of, it's a plywood version of the of the shape right? and then I dug a hole in the ground and I put the plywood thing in and put some weights on then poured concrete I put chicken wire and all sorts of stuff around yeah. it mm -hmm. and then um, and then filled it with concrete up to the, the level of the, the top of the the um the lead uh, you know the designed 
top and then uh, got these baths uphill and um, had to take out the standard plumbing and put in a, a just a angled pipe you know, and so it was standing up and once it was melted, you'd lower it down, it would run out. Right. But um, got the bards really hot, but trying to get the lead to start melting, it's only just touching the bards in, you know, in spots. So until you actually get a little bit of melted lead, you're, um, um, you know, it's, it's just, every the bath gets red hot, the, the, the enamel starts pinging off it and everything. Oh, but, right. But it, it wasn't but dicey melting, working but, with, with lead too uh, hot, boiling lead. Yeah, so I got three and a half tonnes of melted lead in the you know in the, the two bards in the finish they were supported on bits of railway line over the these pits that were full of fire and i'm you know stoking it all up and i'm dressed in my old army jacket you know with, 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 to, to sort of protect me from the heat with my you know, mm. boots and gauntlets and things on um and you have to light a fire in the concrete mold to heat the mold and to dry it out because right. if you put the melted lead in, the water in the concrete oh, boils and it all pops. Just crack and yeah, well, it pops off and it, you end up with your lead ballast with bits of chips of concrete all the way through it. Right. So, so all of this was told, taught to me by the Wilsons, right? They, mm. they, I said, well, how am I going to do this? They said. So, um, uh, yeah, so then I had these um, these two mars, baths of molten lead and, and uh, I was about to pour it in. I thought, how the hell am I going to get it out? Of that, and then I, I so I decided. Well, I, I had some threaded rod, so I, I stuck some threaded rod in there, and I thought, well, I'll lift it up one way or another. Yeah. But anyhow, so when I when I um, poured this this lead in, it was magic the way it it uh, it flowed, and and you know it's like mercury, you know. Mm. Anyhow, it, it it all actually worked astoundingly well, which was which was great. Um, and then I my wife Mary then, and wasn't my wife then, but you know, Mary and her family were there for the show yeah. and they're uh, Irish um, and uh, we, uh, once the, the lead was poured and while it was cooling we had these fires so we, we replaced the, the bars with a big pot and we cooked up these pink eyed potatoes I was talking to you about yeah. before. Mm -hmm. right? So we, we had, they used to, they call them pockets, so it's a, it's a um, hessian bag full of potatoes and we had a half a pound of butter or something like that. So we, we sat there and, and drank beer and and uh, demolished this entire thing, <laughs> twenty kilos or something of potatoes and butter and and beer. And then, and we yeah that was a but then um, the question you right, to get this lead out of the ground. You know, I was three and a half tons. Mm. In, in the finish, I found house jacks. But I, you know, was trying to work out a series of wedges and mm. whatever. It took me a while, but eventually I got house jacks. I lifted it up, got planks of wood with water pipe, two-inch water pipe on it, rolled it into position, then wedges and jacked it and got it till it was true, and then built the boat on top of it. So, wow, yeah. wow, and that's a lot of a lot of weight, a lot of leverage required to work mm. with that. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, I mean, just uh, I'm curious, like. How long did that process take just to get just to get that chunk done so you could get to the starting line with the construction? So it sounds like there's a few steps involved in preparing all of that. And yeah, yeah, there there is. I'm just you, you're doing various things at the, the the one time. Like to start off with, what you do is you draw up. Well, I mean, people who are experts at this probably do it different ways, you know. But but the, what I did was I had the the reduced plans mm -hmm. then you make them full size so i got a big roll of paper um or of heavy duty paper from the the pulp and paper mill and um rolled it out in the local scout hall and then scaled everything up and then with battens you draw the curves and whatever mm -hmm. and then you make up what they call molds which every meter of the boat um are the inside of the planking mm -hmm. right They're the dimensions of the inside of the planking so then you make up with scrap timber these these shapes and then you run stringers around the outside that imitate the, the planks if you like mm -hmm. and then you um uh then you this sits on top of the keel with the timber keel which is on top of the lead ballast and you, you build the, the backbone so i've got the stem laminated up the horn timber and um, uh, stern post horn timber and so on all in place mm -hmm. so you've got the two-dimensional outline of the bottom of the boat the backbone of the boat there 
you've got the the mould on top of it. You've got the strings going around. It looks like a boat now. You know, mm. So finally, you can actually see shape. this. You know, it's, and it's the size. There, but there's nothing. It, there's no boat in it yet. All of that gets thrown away. Well, not mm. you know the backbone stays, but the, the so then you um, you cut all these notches in the in the backbone to take the the ribs, and uh, then you steam the ribs so they're flexible, and you heat them up in a steam and pipe you know with the fire and a Mm. steam going everywhere and once they're cooked enough they become quite flexible and then you with clamps so you had one person in the boat this is none of those things where you needed extra bods so had somebody with gloves on grabs the hot timber out of the steamer pushes it up to a fellow called Jim Nichols was helping me there and and up into the the um the top and he Mary would be down on the bottom locating the the, the notch you know the end of it in the notch and then yeah Jim would just push down and belt down on the top to bend the, the timber to the shape, and I was there with clamps to pull it in and um, onto the stringers and, and make it the, the right thing. And then Jim would be up there with a the big, you know, mallet and just belting the crap out of it to drive it in and make it. And then you, as soon as that was done, you get onto the next and the next and, and work all your way down the boat. Yeah. So you get the, in, the insides, you know, the ribs in, and uh, once they cooled, then you start with the planks and you. You, um, the stringers were placed so that the, the, the top plank, the, the, the um, uh, shear plank, is would, would go on without having to move anything. Mm -hmm. So, um, so and, and all the what I'd done was all of the front at the stations, the, the moulds had marks where the planks edges were supposed to go. So you divide if you got. 24 planks on the side you divide it you put marks where they so you know before you start where mm. you want the planks to go and once again the Wilsons gave me all sorts of issue you know advice on that but you run battens around and 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 see where the planks want to lie naturally so you're not forcing them too much mm. and uh yeah so then you put in the planks and um yeah I don't know am I going to too much detail no, no, no that's really but, interesting and um for mm. People listening to this trying to understand the process, it's easy to gloss over what's involved. Mm. And so, to, to explain that, that little detail gives you an appreciation when you visualize what's involved, um, yeah, why, okay. why, why it takes thousands of hours and why there's so much. Well, each plank took a day to, to make basically because you've got it, you put on a flat batten to, to see where it wants to lie. You know, mm. So, because with the complex curve, the planks are actually going up like this and those are going like that and this one's going here and, but you've got to fill in all the gaps mm. between the, the edges so they're they're they're, they're not uh, it's not a just bang them it's on it's a real you know. mathematical uh, challenge so what you do is you measure the once you've done the battens you measure your, your distances on each of these um and then you you lay your plank out you you mark that you also have got the, the curve of the top and the bottom if there is any curve mm. so your plank might be six or eight inches wide and you're making a four inch plank out of it because of the curve that it needs to do all the flare or whatever mm. depending um and then i measure the curve on each of the ribs so where they're curved this way i've got a hollow the i've got around the plank because mm. i'm doing the inside not the outside and where they're curved here i've got a hollow the 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 plank so i had planes that had rounded blades and then you could hollow out and I'd measure the, the amount of curve in each each of the ribs so that you wouldn't fit a cigarette paper between it was the, the that's the, the standard wow. you test with between the plank and the and the rib anywhere, you know, there's no no um, no gap. But also that means um, the you can't have a plank that's right angles at the top because when you put it on it's going to you know, the gap on the outside if it's on the too much of a curve can be too wide for the thing. So, so the angle of I don't know if I'm explaining this very well, but the yeah, the top well. edge and the bottom edge aren't right angles. Yeah, virtually anywhere they're either they're, they're sloped so that you on the outside seam should be about three eighths of an inch opening, and the inside there should be none. Right, and so you have to figure that out as you're going on a three D shape the whole way through as you're building it. So yeah. So, so did, did you have many planks that you had to throw away and 
start again because you were playing too much out or it just wasn't quite right. Because it sounds, yeah. it's a, it's a yeah. moulding that timber and shaping the timber in a three dimensional way. So, you know, getting down to tolerances of less than a cigarette paper, yeah. um, yeah. you know, it's pretty, a lot of precision is required. Yes. Um, no, I didn't. I I didn't get to near the end and 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 stuff any up. I did a couple where I I made a mistake at the start. Except that where the planks are joined, because um, they're not full of the planks. Oh, I've got a, there's a butt block there. Mm -hmm. So, the, and what you do is, is this the end on end joins. You're end on about? end join, yeah. and then it's got five um, nails in each end, and that. And that is wider than the plank, so it bears on the plank above and plank below. So I'd make a mark on each, I would run it past the two ribs because I'm longer than needed. I'd make a mark on each one, and I was supposed to cut halfway between the two. And on two different occasions, I cut to the wrong line. Right. Um, so I, did, I remember those places because you can do nothing with that plank no. anymore because it's you know you, you can't reshape it and you can't mm. anyhow so yeah those those were a bit disappointing but that's it um, okay mm. and in terms of the construction of the hull and decks how much of that was in terms of the overall project what proportion of the time was was spent just to get to that stage where you've got a closed and um if you include putting the deck on and laying the deck and so on um I was nearly there because what I've done here, if you look, is I've got, got very little actual fancy stuff on the inside. I just thought I, I'd keep the timber so beautiful. Mm. I d didn't think it needed much more. So this, I mean, I did align it because I like to see, it's great the, to see the timber. It. So I've got a, a little plywood shelf here with blackwood on the front, making the, the, the cupboards, if you like, where the, it took a, a bit of time. But... Um, it was um, probably only about 20% in the internal fit out where mm. some boats it's like 80% mm. um, but I don't like the way a lot of small boats are chopped into such small sections and so on they, they're almost claustrophobic mm. um, so, so what's the yeah. length of cigar? 35 feet yeah, so the volume mm. in here she feels mm. spacious and open and mm. flows really nicely and Mm. Yeah, well, one of the things that you'll notice is that the deck beams are full width. I haven't got coach oh, house and side of decks. Of course, right. And so that gives you the extra it gives you head, head room and width. Yeah, and it's a visual thing as well. When I Kailani was the one that, that, that this design that was already in existence, I went and had a look at her, and she had side decks coming out here, and then the coach house, mm. and you're sitting underneath, you know, the, down and the, underneath yeah, with it. Yeah, and um, I couldn't see the point in it, so uh, I came up with this idea of making the the deck beam full width, because yeah. when you're sailing as you heel, if you, when your gunnel goes under, the drag increases tremendously. Mm. Um, if you're looking at capsizing or whatever, then this this gives you way way greater stability mm. in terms of once you you start to you get over your buoyancy is right out out to the edge. It's easier to waterproof because there are, you've, you've yeah, reduced got, that number of joints. Yeah, yeah. it's stronger. And stronger you've as well. Reduced, you've got that yeah. curve so, span yeah. from side to side. Yeah. So there's no no good reason for having side decks except that if you're on a boat that's so big that you can't step up. You know, you yeah. have to get around. Yeah. And anyhow, while I was away on the oil rigs one time, I drew up this, this, and then I took it to Jock and said, well, what do you think, Jock? You know, I don't want to do this. You know, it's your, your design. And uh, he, he said, uh, look, when I first designed her, that's exactly how I had her. Right. And wow. uh, I said, so you don't mind if I didn't do that. <laughs> so he was, he was very happy because he said, no, he designed her like this cause he's, he, for all the reasons. Mm. But he said, she's too small to need side decks. Mm. You know? Yeah, and uh, uh, so he was wrapped. Yeah. So we come done a full circle. Uh, so okay. Yeah. And and the, and the master's master's deck steps. So yep. that keeps water out of the out of the bilge and out of the boat too, which is yep. Yes, but she was deck step because I wanted to go through the canals of Europe as well. Ah, uh -huh. okay. So, so you we can lower it lay, down. Lay it down more easily. Mm, yeah. Okay, and so um, and so so then finally the the construction completion date was approaching and you almost there after three years 
And what what were your plans from there? Uh, and then what what did you do next once you um, to the point where we're about to? Yeah, about to do, on, on, just to, if someone you know, for anyone who might be in in that situation, what, the way we launched it was um, there was an old bus chassis down the down the way, and um, I jacked her up just with jacks and car jacks mm -hmm. and lifted it up and and uh, backed the bus chassis in underneath right. <laughs> removing one jack and you know it's going across the, the members so it took a little while to yeah to to, to do it it's, yeah and um i just had ropes going to the side of the shed so it didn't fall over and um and back this under and then lowered it down onto a bus chassis and then had a bulldozer just trundle me down the driveway into the water you know, at low wow. tide. how so, much does yeah. she weigh in total Seven tons, about. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that was the. the, the and how did you stay by the bus to steer the chassis so that she didn't fall either way? Oh, we welded up a couple of uprights. Oh, okay. Gotcha. The gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah, once, once the boat Made was on, little, we welded up the cradle. Yeah. 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 And I, I steered it. He had a big draw bar on the, the dozer and, and just he drove me down and we just drove over the road and down into the, <laughs> into the water. So, yeah, pretty, like, I think it cost me a carton of beer or something. Pretty efficient way to launch yeah. New York. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So, yeah. Um, so, yeah, my plan then was just to go sailing, mm -hmm. as it is now. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so we launched her. The next day, I, I just lifted the mast up with a couple of bits of 4 by 2 stood it up. It's a bit different to yours. Yeah, in yeah. Fact, just put the... the um, Hensel halyard through a turning block on the on the bow fitting mm -hmm. back to the sheet winch mm -hmm. and had a just couple of costly shearlings and just lifted it up and stood it up put, right. kept it up and next day we went sailing mm -hmm. so, and, and, mm. and how, how did you go about in terms of putting your rig together and your sails together did you make those get those made by no. the view by the second hand or what did you do there or well, I had them all made by mewers Mm -hmm. you know, one of the, the, the deals that we, we had, because Muir's had a boatyard chandlery thing down at Battery Point in Hobart, and I just got everything through them and they mm -hmm. gave me wonderful deals. Um, when I was looking at buying the sails, because I didn't have much money, mm -hmm. um, I was looking at maybe getting, various people were getting them made in Hong Kong at the time, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, they had a sail loft at Muir's, and I, I asked them for a quote and they said well what do you think they would cost and i said well i can get them made in hong kong for this and they said oh all right then we'll we'll do it for that right. um, and we'll get our apprentice to do it when he's not busy because we've got this apprentice sale maker so he can these could be your project so in the finish you know when you're doing a, a would work at school or whatever, you know, you get the best of everything for your, for your, I yeah. got the best of everything for this real budget price. And those sales are still, still working today. I've replaced the, the Genoa and the number two, yeah. but all the rest of them, oh, sorry, and the main, we'll think about it. So no, I've replaced the Genoa and the main, the number two is still, still going strong, but they're so well made. Mm. And Craig Fox, the fellow that made them, he's the sail maker in his own right for, for many years now yeah. and, and so on. But, yeah, no, so, so that all worked well. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Okay, and so when you well, when you set off, what what did you do? Where did you go? What did you just went, went to the world? We so, just okay, hoisted the sails five days later. We had a big party, mm -hmm. um, and um, and then headed off across Bass Strait and came back four years later. Wow, and amazing! And where did your where did your travels take you? Um, we spent two years on the east coast of Australia, mm -hmm. um, up and down and round and about. And in those days, with sextants and with um, uh, limited weather forecasts, if you like, mm -hmm. um, you didn't play around in the cyclone season because, you know, so cyclone seasons were spent in, in cans or, you know, around um, doing, you know, getting money together and, and or going exploring or, or whatever. Yeah. But... Um, so yeah, then we we left. We, we sailed around to Darwin from uh, from Hobart up all the way, or Tassie all the way up to to uh, to Darwin, and then headed off um, across the Indian Ocean. Mm -hmm. um, so it was a wonderful trip. There's so much to see on the coast of Australia, as you know. You mm -hmm. know and, yeah. um, uh, and then uh, 
went across to uh, Christmas Island, Cocos, Keelings, Chagos, Archipelago, um, Seychelles, Mombasa. Mm-hmm. Um, we, when we got to Mombasa, we wanted to drive around Africa. So we got to know the people in the Mombasa Yacht Club and, and uh, they were wonderful, wonderful people. But something out of, um, you know, the, the, uh, the out of Africa type um, stories you read, it was exactly that. But they were just magic, magic people, but living in a, in a different world, in a different era. In a, um, um, but they had a sh- there was a ship breaking yard up the way. We decided to put down a, a moor and got some off-cut massive anchor chain from the ship breaking yard. Um, like there was a ton of it or something and, mm-hmm. and brought it back and, and it's, it's 90 feet, so 30 metre deep harbour in Mombasa with very strong currents. So yeah, right. So that's, with, that's a lot of depth and a lot of... Yeah, we set a mooring according to the, the way that they'd found work, which was a rope riser, a, you know, hefty um, rope riser and uh, um, to a float. And then from the float, you have an eye in the, in the riser and then you have from the, the, that eye to your, your Samson post, uh, mm-hmm. a, a short length with an eye in both ends. Um, and uh, then they have various of the, the people that worked around the boat club looked after the the boats of the different people you know that owned the boats there. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, so we said, well, could one of them look after Sagan while we we're away? And um, there was this lovely young fellow who was a gardener, and uh, they said, we well, have a chat with him. And we had a chat with him, and he said, yes, could he stay on board? And uh, well, I said, oh, sure, you know, we're completely, we're, the, the locals were aghast. They thought that, you know, he, he would cause, you know, problems and, and whatever. But yeah. he was wonderful. James, he was called. But he, when we, um, when we returned after a, a, nearly a year of travels, the boat was just gleaming. You could see the, the polish from mm. on shore and, and the pride he had in, in looking after our boat. And apparently, you know, the whole time we were away, he was... Uh, He'd come back from work and he'd be there polishing and just about, uh, you know, polish the paint off the hull. Wow. Wow. <laughs> but, but, was he yeah. a pretty amazing experience for him to be able to stay on the yacht. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 He was, and he, he um, most of the time he slept up on deck because it was too, it was in the tropics, you know, it was pretty hot down below. But, uh, yeah. I don't know, yeah. but uh, he didn't ever, we'd said he could stay on, sleep on the, the mattress on, you know, these bunks are so comfy and whatever, but he mainly said he slept on the floor. It was too, he wasn't, didn't like mattresses and stuff, so he happily slept on the floor and he ate and went, so he, yeah, he was brilliant. Okay. A lovely, lovely fellow. Yeah. Wow, they're really fortunate. Mm. You come across mm. some special people yeah. in all sorts of places where you, you don't know what to expect. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Human yeah. beings uh, yeah. at their core are pretty good people, especially when it comes yeah. to sailors and boats for some reason. Yeah, well, that's, come from yeah, the, that's come from the ocean, which come them. from the road. It's mm. used to get treated differently. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And so, so your travels and adventure through Africa. I mean, you were telling me a little bit about that last night, but tell me some more about that in terms of how you how you funded your way around Africa and, and created creatively and, and some of the things you saw. Yeah, well, one of the people that we got to meet, and there are always stories within stories. But while we were travelling, we we had ham radio back in those days, just the way you kept us as an HF radio, mm-hmm. but. Um, uh, most of the yachties were um, pirates, as they called them. Though they didn't have the license because of uh, various reasons. So you made up your own call sign, and, and then you kept, and, and you'd be chatting, and um, just between yachts. So we 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 did that as we're travelling around, and, and we, yeah. we started up what was called Dusty's Net. You know, just started off between two boats, and then more and more and more kept joining in. We had sixty different boats at that at the finish of that. And uh, it turned out that a lot of the ham radio buffs on land used to listen in. We didn't realise. Right. But then as we were coming closer to things, we'd get this, you know, at the end of one of our sessions, you know, breaker, breaker, this is so-and-so, and we're from Nairobi or we're from, you know, Durban or, or wherever. And so I made friends before I arrived there in, in Africa um, over this ham radio mm-hmm. set up. And, um, and one of them was up in Nairobi and, and we were up there and there's a notorious sort of 
area for buying cars that have done the Africa trip. You know, yeah. So when they get to Nairobi, they, they come down from England or whatever and driven through the Sahara and whatever, and then they flog off the, the old beast you know, in Nairobi and they fly home. Yeah, yeah. And so we thought, well, we'll get one of them. You know? But um, when we got to Nairobi, they said, oh, no, <laughs> don't, don't touch them. You know? They're already flogged in there. You know? And I thought that might be the case, but I didn't have a better solution. And mm -hmm. one of the guys that we, we met there, his mother worked as a nurse um, in, in all the, the, the surrounding townships and whatever. And she just had a, a long wheelbase Series 2 Land Rover. They were just replacing it. And her, her nursing Land Rover, mm. which was in immaculate condition, mm. and and perfectly, perfectly maintained, was basically ours, you know, and we, it was a, I had to actually borrow, no, I didn't, no, um, we could afford the Land Rover. Yeah. But to travel in Africa, you had, have to have a carnet de passage, which means you deposit the equivalent of the value of that Land Rover in a bank account. And if you sell the Land Rover before you bring it back to where you started from, you forfeit that money. Because what they didn't want was people travelling, bringing cars down and, and flogging them in Africa and, and making money out of it. You know? Right. So, right. Um, yeah, so we, we couldn't sell the Land Rover until we got back to Kenya again. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I had to borrow from my brother. So total all their money for their time. Yeah. So we had no money. We had a car, but we had no money. And uh, we came up with an idea, um, talking to some people in a bar or whatever, you know, that, that they were paying a fortune to do this little three, three or four day tour of, of the national parks. Yeah. And we thought, well, you know, for a fraction of that, we you come with us and, you know, and uh, anyhow, they said, oh, it could be, you know. So then we, we, we thought about it and we just came up with an idea that if we could get someone to pay all the running costs, you know, the petrol, the flat tyres, you know, the oil for oil changes, you know, breakdowns and whatever. Yeah. Um, we put in a kitty for the food, but we could go indefinitely because mm. we could have, all we are doing was paying for food. Yeah. And uh, we estimated it would be about, I think it was about $100 a week for probably would cost you know the you know our our passengers so if you had three passengers you know it's three hundred dollars a week would cover all the all of that back then yeah you know, equivalent to three thousand a week or something yeah you know. compared to paying but, ten times amount for an organized tour or what have you yeah so we put a, there was a, a, a backpackers sort of place in in nairobi called ma roaches mm -hmm. and uh she had this beautiful old house with a Lovely garden. It was just full of tents, so yeah. everybody, you know, who, you know, was sort of backpacking through um, through Africa would stop at Mar Roaches. So we we put a little notice up on the the board there saying, well, you know, this is our plan. You know, if you want to do that, and we had a queue of about twenty people going out the door next Fantastic. morning. So, Fantastic! Fantastic! Uh, so, yeah. Amazing what you can create or come up. You know, do mm -hmm. do it just a, just starts with an idea, and you can find some sort of like minded people, and you know. Suddenly mm. you're on your way, traveling around Africa, and you know been able to do it quite comfortably. Yeah, yeah. So we 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 travelled. Uh, God, what was the numbers? Um, Twenty nine thousand kilometres. I think it was in seventeen countries, and wow. and uh, went everywhere. Wow, um, that's a big trip. Yeah, it was was yeah. We were away for about ten months mm -hmm. driving, mm -hmm. um, and we had no um, no schedule. We just went went. Everywhere, yeah. absolutely everywhere. And we camped virtually every night. Mm -hmm. And my, when we got to camp, when we had the, the, the um, Mary would organise the, the tent and, and get things started that way. The, the the guests would get all the wood and the firewood and, and you know we, and whatever going. And I'd just go straight underneath the vehicle and I'd spend half an hour under the vehicle looking at everything, tightening yeah, everything right. that had loosened. Yeah, you know, doing because you're going over really an unbelievable. You know, mm, terrain shakes it, shakes and it. Um, yeah so I had you know everything when you'd see something was loose or there was a crack starting or whatever you yeah. could you could fix it before before it broke and um, mm. yeah then we'd all sort of assemble for dinner and I'd wash the grease off and, and away we'd go wow and did so you have any uh you any what wildlife challenges at all with camping <laughs> Hanging like that. <laughs> oh, yeah. I can't drop yeah. tigers hanging around and things yeah. like that in my mind. Lions, yeah. Um, well, there was a notorious 
thing with lines, which was strange because my son now is in Austria and someone contacted him very recently um, through Facebook, I think it was, saying, was he the, the in your relation to Dusty from Tasmania who they had travelled with? And, yeah. and when uh, and did the and yeah, and then we, they, they, you remember the night with the lions, and um, yeah, we were on the on the escarpment looking out over Savo National Park, and um, we camped just beside the the edge, and then at sunset there was this parade of elephants and giraffes and zebra and wildebeest whenever along this this track between us and the void if you like wow. along the, the thing and we're all sitting there you know with the fire going just watching this astounding sort of thing like you know you, you wouldn't believe mm. and then behind us there was this god almighty sound that i didn't understand what it well, none of us understood exactly what it was to start with but it was a lion just behind us it had come onto the fire if you like and going, oh shit, what's that? And he goes, oh, oh great, and got it. Well, and, what? <laughs> <laughs> and you've never seen six people get into a Land Rover so quickly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So that was, uh, yeah, that was something. And then you know, we, we were sort of putting our heads out, to, you know, can we get out yet or whatever? But yeah, you know, we went away and, and we, we resumed our, our thing. But yeah, that was, that was a, a pretty interesting. But you would often wake up with footprints of lions and hyenas and stuff around the tents mm. you know, where they, they come investigate you in the night. But yeah, you know, you know, but they never went any further in terms of trying to... But the most dangerous night was Mary and I were by ourselves at one stage. When the lakes go down, there's grassland grows in the, the sh- you know, where what was shallow water and the hippos come out and graze it. Right. And we, we pitched our tent in this parkland without thinking too much about it. And then as the sun set, out came the hippos. Wow, they can and, be quite dangerous too, can't they? Yeah, well, two of them started fighting. And I don't know if you've ever seen hippos fight. No. But they run at each other with their mouths agape, right? Massive, right. you know, and they're, they're Big their tusks. tusks pointing yeah. forward. And when they hit, the s- contents of their stomachs come out through their mouths. So this is God oh. Almighty, you know, when you get sort of, um, grass clippings from yeah. mowing the lawn, yeah. that sort of smell, but a bit more fetid. Yeah. And the two, and then the two of them had their jaws, in, and then they're spinning around. Oh, wow. There's tons and tons and tons of animals just spinning yeah. and knocking trees over, and, and we're in our little nylon tent. <laughs> <laughs> Fortunately, they, you know, we're watching out through the, the thing, and fortunately, they didn't come our way. But yeah, yeah. That, was a, that was the scariest night, actually. Yeah. The nasty sort of freak accident until they just tra- <laughs> trampled over you by the way past. Yeah, no, lots of fun. Yeah. And what what did you learn about the about sort of the, the people you met along the way, and the, sort of the African people and the the, the the way they live their lives and the the happiness they have with the simplicity of their lives. What what, what did you learn? Oh, um, there's so much. Um, oh, hmm, it's hard to know where to start. The uh, what are you I thinking? Know, yeah. Let me just <coughs> check the system running happily, and it is. That's good. Okay. Um, one of the uh, one of the things that springs to mind, the first thing that springs to mind initially with that was um, an incredible res- response we had in, um, no, sorry, I'm just thinking that's a, that was when I took our, our boys back when, when Mary was first diagnosed with her cancer. Um, yeah, I'll tell you that story just, just quickly, but basically the, the kids in um, um, Namibia make these little four-wheel drives, model four-wheel drives, out of bush timber and bits of fencing wire. And they're astounding. They've got all the wheels and they've got the windows and the mm-hmm. cabins and the, the headlights and the whole thing. And then they push them with a, another piece of fencing wire and they, they push them along and they drive them around the place, you know, and they play games with them. Yeah. They're astoundingly beautiful things. And um, my kids at that stage were six and eight years old, or well, Mary's and mine, and uh, they were intrigued by these, and then we we said, you know, could we um, could we buy one, or you know, as as for the kids to play with themselves, and and they sort of didn't have much use for money. They weren't really interest, 
interested in that. They said, if you've got something to swap or to trade or whatever. Mm. And we brought out a, a bag of oranges, which wasn't what we were thinking of, of trading. And these kids just went bananas. Well, bananas. They went crazy. They'd never seen an orange, you know, and they just all wanted, or well, they, they must have seen, had some idea, but it was... It was almost mayhem. Wow. As these kids were just delighted about these oranges. You know, here they were, you know, such ingenious kids, but they're living in in dry dirt with dry, you know, sort of scrub around and cattle, sort of here and there, and mm. um, yeah, something juicy and sweet like that was. And it was just we 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 did nearly cause a riot because we, we didn't have enough oranges for everybody, mm. and they were all fighting each other to try and get some. You know. Wow. And, you know yeah, and it was just, you know, the things that we just took for granted, we just casually brought out this little bag of oranges and and we had, you know, 20 or 30 kids just about tearing each other to pieces <laughs> to try and get some. So, uh, yeah, but but in general, um, the, the simpler the people were, the, the nicer they were. When we got in, we had a couple of interesting uh, interactions in cities Mm -hmm. And mainly with people who are fairly well dressed, um, yeah. And there's a huge, obviously, there's a huge difference in what we consider wealthy and what they consider wealthy. And yeah. to them, we were ridiculously wealthy, mm. so we were fair game for people that were opportunistic. Mm -hmm. But when you got out into the villages where they really had nothing, you were as safe as safe. You know, it was mm. it was um, and friendly, welcoming welcoming people the main problem was that we were never alone um when you're anywhere near people because they would s sit around our camp and watch us because <laughs> well, they're just so fascinated by well yeah so, no, nothing like this happens you know we were yeah. a long way out and and we would just have a circle of people sitting around watching us and we we'd initially start to chat and whatever but then we wanted to do our thing and they wouldn't go away they were just sitting, literally, when you went to have a crap, you know, you had an audience. <laughs> because they, they just never said it. It did get to me sometimes. Yes. <laughs> so just leave us alone. But to them, this is a once in a, well, once in a lifetime, mm. a very rare thing. Mm. And they would just sit and, and watch. They'd sit on just their haunches and chat them. amongst themselves and point, you know, and when you did pull something out, they go, oh, you know, and, yeah. and, yeah. and whatever. But, um, yeah, we were, we were a, a big... Um, entertainment and, and sometimes you'd look around you'd realize there were 200 people in a circle around you just, wow you know, that's in the quite a bit of getting used to yeah yeah they weren't interfering they were just watching just curious mm. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. okay what were some of the other sites on the african continent you saw that stick in your mind mm. um the well, the Rift Valley is, is uh, Africa has basically been torn in half and part of the, the rift in the middle has dropped and it runs from the north, you know, from somewhere up well north. I've forgotten the, the geography now, but all the way through the, the, the central Africa down to the south and down in the bottom is fertile um, plains and, and, uh, and rivers and so on and up on these escarpments and then it's flat again on, on top. Um, uh, is entirely different uh, country, and it's, you know, you, you, up, you know, thousands of meters. Uh, mm -hmm. in the, so, I mean, Nairobi itself is nine thousand feet, which is three thousand meters mm. above sea level. You know, it's not a. a it's um, quite elevated. Yeah, yeah. and then, yeah, we went up Mount Kenya, which I was trying to think what height Mount Kenya and Kilimanjaro and so on. I've forgotten now, but um, just the the, the vista, the, the distance you can see. Um, and and uh, yeah, just um, it, is it goes on because you're up. Th so I'm not explaining this very well, but just that vastness, you know, this incredible vastness, mm. because you're standing on top of this escarpment. There's nothing in your way, and mm. you can just see all of Africa. It seems mm. yeah. so. Um, uh, yeah, so there's that, but the other obviously is just the herds of animals, um, and just so many interactions with with animals in different ways. 
But when we were there back in the 80s, they were estimating that it was only about 10 to 15 percent of the animals that were there before, you know, 200 years ago were still wow. roaming. Mm -hmm. And um, in subsequent years, I think it's now down to about 5 percent because, in particular, fences. Um, when you put fences up, all the migration has to stop, you know, and you know, the migrating herds can't go to their to their summer or winter, you know, the dry season, mm. wet season pastures and so on, and, and they die. There was also, I mean, if you're trying to make money out of the land and you're growing beef cattle, you, you can't have a herd of wildebeests grazing on your property. No. So there's massive slaughter, slaughter of, of, of animals um, so that people could make money. Mm. Um, so... It was very much conscious of of um, these. This is a changing world. Even mm. back then, it was changing so quickly. And are they turning that around now? Do you know? No, they, no, they really no, no. That? You can't. You know, unless with the numbers of people increasing, there's not enough food, you know, arable land to share with the animals. Mm. And so, the, fortunately, they're making a lot of money from tourists in the national parks. Mm -hmm. And if it wasn't for that, then then you know yeah. they they'd have no refuge at all. Yeah. But in the national parks, there's still significant numbers. But I'm not sure where it is now. But it's it's obviously it's a it's a massive con um, combat for the amount mm. of land that's saved by tourism. Yeah. It's so. Yeah. But we had some interesting encounters with elephants and yeah. Anyhow, you know, this. But, uh, but the, the the best thing of the the lot is just to be sitting completely still and watching these massive animals just mm. wandering around, you know, in their own element, in their you know, at their own pace, and and uh, it's just completely marvellous, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Magnificent to see them mm. open space in the wild like that. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I mean there are hundreds and hundreds of stories. I can't sort of think of which ones to start and yeah. tell. But I anyway. imagine. Mm. So then, your, so then your 10 months came to an end eventually and, and, and it came to an end because you'd, you'd seen what you wanted to see or because you were ready to um, move on? We, we were looking at or? going around to um, up through the Atlantic and, and onwards. Um, but um, at that stage, there was still apartheid in South Africa. So we couldn't go into South Africa f from, you know, from north. Mm -hmm. uh, once you've been to South Africa at that stage, you couldn't visit another African country. You'd be be banned. Right. So I did want to go to South Africa, and and uh, there were lots of you know met people and so on there. There's a lot of history around South Africa, and if you're going around Cape of Good Hope, you've got to go around South Africa. Mm. So we went back, and then we continued our our sailing. Uh, so we went to the Comores. Oh, we went to Zanzibar. Mm -hmm. you know, Zanzibar is the most magical um, destination for a sailor, I think, in terms of complete sort of mystic magic. You know, it's it's crazy. You know, mm -hmm. it's, it's a lovely, lovely place. But it was the centre of the slave trade. It's the centre of the spices. When we went into um, the harbour there, the smell of cloves and, and vanilla pods and, and whatever is just... And all the dows, all back then, anyhow, it was just full of dows, mm. and, and then there were the minarets and the and the you know the um, the whole Muslim thing, and all the streets are crooked, so that okay. you can't see too far down them, and the buildings nearly meet over the top, and they're not made for cars; they're just made so you walk down, and they've got these balconies that come out to they're almost touching above you, wow. so it's like walking down these subterranean sort of. And the doors are a major feature of each house. Mm -hmm. So the doors are massive timber studded, carved, ornate you know, things. And uh, anyhow, it's just incredible. Uh, and the, the dowels were huge ships, you know, mm. all hand built, hand hewn, and built by eye with none of this fancy stuff. They just mm. put together. So no, it was, it was great. Yeah. Okay. Um, sounds like a pretty magical place to sail to. Oh, yeah. yeah. And how long did you spend there? I can't remember of several weeks okay. anyhow. Yeah, okay. yeah, just wandering, wandering around, and and you know, one. <laughs> um, they, that's where we first got into African rum. They call it. It's just white spirit. It made from sugar cane, mm -hmm. and then um, you add spices and, and stuff to it. It's, it's like a dollar a liter or something, but. 
we got a lot of, of vanilla pods and, and um, cloves and um, cardamom, all sorts of different spices and stuff yeah. from, from there. And then we, we headed on down to um, Madagascar, um, no, to the Comores first, and then uh, it's the Comores, which are French, so they're another French territory, mm -hmm. um, or ex French, no, French too, I think. Yeah. And that's where we, we ended up. Um, the rum there they were selling for a dollar a litre um, and so we, we got several bottles of it and then and you put in vanilla pods and various other things and let it sit for a while and yeah. don't, don't, it's a hundred or not a hundred percent it's ninety something percent alcohol it's pure distilled wow you know, it's pure, um, and you just craft the taste to suit yeah, your taste so buds. Then you, and you you know it lasts a long time mm. yeah. Um, yeah I'm just sorry in Madagascar um, they, they carve these semi-precious stones into balls and they make a game called solitaire. It's a board game where you hop the, the balls in, around, but each ball is made of a different type of semi-precious stone. And, wow. Um, yeah, you still always have a set on board, but I haven't at the moment. Yeah. Okay. But, uh, yeah, and then into South Africa, into Durban. Mm -hmm. um, and it was just sailing into an entirely different world. You know, there were supermarkets, there were... Mm. You know, there were modern cars, there were high-rise apartments, there were lifts, traffic lights, all that sort of stuff, which we just hadn't seen. Yeah, what a massive yeah, contrast yeah, to... Yeah. Since well, in Nairobi, there was some to some degree. And, but, mm -hmm. um, mm, yeah, so um, then we hired a car there and spent several weeks driving around South Africa and the, the game parks and the wineries and the you know restaurants and you know, in very different much, much, much more wealthy country than, than anywhere mm -hmm. else in, in Africa at the time. Mm -hmm. It just reminds me, we went, in our travels, we went through um, Uganda um, just after Eddie, Eddie Amin had been deposed and so on. We had all the, the boy soldiers and so on of wow. Bote and whatever. Yeah, was, so Africa was full of all sorts of different things. That was the most dangerous time was being held up by a, about a 12 year old with an automatic weapon of some sort because he wanted to ride home wow and he was obviously high on something yeah and uh yeah so that was yeah we took him home <laughs> <laughs> massive well, contrast yeah. isn't it, to, to what we what we know yeah. life to be in australia and the things we take mm. for granted mm. Mm. Yeah. interesting time then how did you find south africa during apartheid i guess in terms of it's really strange because it's not well it's uh, a lot of the South Africans said to said to us, you know, the white South Africans said to us, um, "You bloody Australians, you know, you're more apartheid than we are, you know. At least we're honest about it. You, you just <laughs> that you makes know, it okay. <laughs> you know, you've got the white Australia policy. You've got, you know, the yeah. you, know, you 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 treat your Aboriginal people, you know, way worse than we treat our people. Mm. Who are you to be telling us how to live our?" Mm. Lives and what we should do, and, and there was so much truth in that you couldn't. Mm. Yeah, Interesting could, perspective, isn't it? Yeah, you could say, but but uh, um, but really, you know, the the the, the uh, situation of the Aboriginal people in Australia was not um, dissimilar. It was arguably worse than than the you know, the the black people of South Africa, who are. A, a range of people there are there's there are zulus and there are kosa and i've forgotten the names of the different tribes but they're very very different people as well with different customs different stature different clothing and 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 um so on and they've got homelands and they had then the homelands i'm not sure if they still got homelands now um where they had sort of an autonomous rule and they were still ruled by their own sort of chiefs mm -hmm. and so on to some degree mm -hmm. Um, but it was it was wrong and it was weird and it was it was very strange that you couldn't have like you go into the shops and there, the only black people were people cleaning the floor or whatever there were no black people shopping mm. you know whereas you know out on the street of course there are but they're they're sitting in different places it was very it, it, it was obviously wrong mm. but it, but at the same time um, uh, so we chatted really easily with 
you know, I don't know exactly what the correct word to say is. Negroes is what they used to be called, but mm. you know, or the, or, or but anyway, I'm not sure what the correct word is now. But the indigenous people, but you know, we we they didn't seem to um, uh, be you know, antagonistic or whatever or, or resentful, yeah. and, and they were really friendly and welcoming, and we we made some good friends with because as we. Personally, you know, I just treat people like people. I don't mm. care what colour their skin is mm. or their religion, provided they don't you know, do me any harm, I won't do them any yeah. harm. Yeah. But, and and um, we did uh, go wandering around Soweto and things, having a bit of a look, and, and the, local, the, the local whites were horrified. But we didn't find... It was t- in the time of the riots and stuff down there, but... Mm. But we were probably naive, I guess is the best way to well, describe it. A smile, a smile gets you a long way. A yeah. smile and a friendly face gets you a long way too in this world, isn't it? You realise what, what your skin colour is or what your background is. Yeah, and just being open. And you'd end up with... Mary was terrific. She was a kindergarten teacher mm-hmm. and terrific with kids. Mm-hmm. And um, she would you know, give out coloured pencils. They'd be after lollies and she'd be giving out coloured pencils and they were delighted, you know. And, mm. and then we'd have kids all around us and then, then the adults would come. And, mm. and she was able to entertain anyone anywhere. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so, yeah, but... Um, but it, you know, there were. It was when you're in the in the shopping centres, if you like, of the bigger cities and so on. It could be Europe. You know, it was it was uh, completely un-African, if you like, mm. and, and you can get that. Really thing. obvious the mm. segregation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. And so, where did your travels take you from Africa to next? Uh, well, that's when I finally decided that. Um, sorry, it, uh, that I might. Um, uh, make a future with Mary, and mm-hmm. um, and okay, it was sort there's of a that long, there's a long probationary period you had to give. Oh, sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, we finally decided that we we, you know, I asked her to marry me, and she uh, accepted. And um, then because you know, being old fashioned, we decided that you do before you have kids, right? Yeah. But anyhow, so um, but she said, well, the only thing is that I'm not going to be changing nappies while I'm throwing up. <laughs> Or see, because Mary always got seasick, mm-hmm. and um, uh, she had an antidote for seasick. She'd prop herself in that corner there. She'd read a book with a little glass of rum beside her, and I'd do all the sailing. And when we got there, time for Mary to come back up again. Yeah, but, but, but <laughs> she did her watches and whatever, but she did. Yeah, so, but um, yeah, so then we sort of abandoned a round the world trip. Um, and uh, she flew home, and I, I sailed home by myself across the Southern Ocean mm-hmm. um, in Tagane. And yeah, she which is, which is what a I feat, built her which for. Is a feat in yeah. itself. So, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. so if ever you're going that way, there's some islands called Amsterdam and St Paul Islands. They're French Antarctic territories. Mm-hmm. But um, I'm just thinking of your draft. But the uh, two point two. Yeah. The the. Um, Il St. Paul is a breached volcano with the breach facing northeast, so you can go inside oh, wow. this volcano. Mm-hmm. And uh, I spent 10 days in there, absolute magic. You're surrounded by sea elephants, or elephant seals, whichever you want to call them, mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. and fur seals and penguins, and you know, there are abalone and crayfish. Wow, that's and, incredible. You know, it's unbelievable. And, just, and you're surrounded by these cliffs of the, of the, of the vent of the volcano. And, Absolutely magic. So you're, and you're navigating your way home on, on your own, using a sextant and taking your sights, and yeah. that's your with the wind vane self steering. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, it was terrific. Easy. Wow. It was and we haven't really talked about it, but yeah. I mean, how well does the sail sail? And, and, and what's what is the, the the motion generally like to see? You know? She's very sea kindly. She was mm-hmm. d- designed for the big oceans. She's she's got a deep heel rather than a flat flat bottom if you like so mm-hmm. she doesn't pound at all going to wind when she runs downwind very well but nothing it doesn't surf mm. you know so you're not looking at taking off to, so she's very she's built for the deep ocean for the you know sort of high latitude oceans and things and she's handled it beautifully mm-hmm. and um 
Yeah, I've had you know waves wash over the entire boat where there's nothing above water except the mast, and and she just shakes it off and keeps going. And, wow. Yeah, yeah. So. Yeah. Incredible. Yeah, and the whole way back she steered herself. Mm -hmm. So I just you know. So the wind mm -hmm. wind vane worked well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah so. And um, how long did that passage take you? Fifty days. I think that it was back to yeah. back to Hobart. Mm -hmm. you know? Um, I ended up coming into Melbourne actually. Okay. I had to fly to Ireland for a wedding. Mm -hmm. which, you know, my wife's sister was getting married in Ireland, so. Mm -hmm. yeah. But anyway, yeah. Yeah, okay. So. And when you got back to mm. Australia, did you get married mm. back in Australia? Yeah, back in, in Tassie. Mm -hmm. But one of the one of the interesting things to to, well, you know about Great Circle routes and things like that, but um, I didn't go the Great Circle route coming back because it went too far south. So mm -hmm. I sailed basically the 40th parallel. Mm -hmm. And when the so barometer went up, around. <laughs> yeah, when the barometer, well, the, the thing wasn't how to get there quickly. I wasn't worried about that. It was just mm. to get there in a nice, you know, mm. have, enjoy the sail. Yeah. So as soon as, as the high, as the barometer went up, you could go south. And as the barometer went down, you go north. And mm. so the whole way across, I, I didn't ever have the wind forward of the beam. So I had a, a lovely It's a great trip. ride. Mm. But in the finish, I passed 800 miles south of Perth. And then gradually come up because Perth's such a long way north. People don't realise in Australia how far north, if you like, Perth is. It's like Sydney, mm -hmm. same sort of latitude as Sydney, right, rather okay. than you know, and Tassie's, you know, as you know, six hundred odd miles south of Sydney. Mm -hmm. So, you know, so yeah. Um, and then the other thing was, I was still uh, something like four four hundred miles offshore, and there was thistle down blowing across the water. Which I just I thought, what the hell's that? You know, they're just the the thistle yeah, yeah. You know, was drifting across Carries the ocean. Away. It's four hundred miles. Wow! And then I could smell smoke. The first part of the you know, physical evidence of land, if you like, was I could smell smoke. Mm -hmm. Hundreds and hundreds of miles out to sea. I've gotten four or five hundred mm. miles out from the coast of Tasmania. Mm. I've been out at Lord Howell, several miles offshore, and yeah. some other bushfires out there, and mm. seen this kind of cover. It's amazing how far that, that spreads. Mm. Yeah, just the, yeah, after being out at the ocean for so long, you your you senses just, pick yeah. it up too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. so then, okay, so then, what, 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 what year is this now that you you, you sailed back mm. to Australia? Um, eighty eight, wasn't it? Yeah. Mm. Okay, so yeah. so um, twenty thirty. 32 years ago, 34 yeah. years ago. Yeah, something like that. Yeah. Wow. So yeah, then we, we came back. Before we, we sailed away, we we um, bought a block of land. And so we if we crashed, we'd have somewhere to come home to. Mm -hmm. And um, and then um, when we came home, we got married under the Low Head Lighthouse, mm -hmm. you know, out on the promontory there, mm -hmm. which um, when my first ancestors on mum's side arrived in Tasmania, they sailed in on a ship that got wrecked on Heavy Reef, and which is just outside the oh, Tamer, wow. and they literally came ashore at the Low Head. Mm -hmm. um, so they, you know, their lifeboats rowed them ashore at Low Head, and uh, yeah, so there's a bit of a circle going It's quite going significant on. But Mary, landmark. Mary's from Georgetown up there, yeah, so that's yeah, where uh, so we went up there for the, the, the party, mm -hmm. um, and then built a house. And, raised the kids mm -hmm. and we just spent a lot of weekends and stuff and school holidays and things sailing on Sagan. Mm -hmm. Kids grew up on Sagan sailing. Yeah. So, wow. Yeah. Where are your kids now? Um, Luke's a naval architect in Melbourne mm -hmm. um, working for British Aerospace Engineering which are the, the, the mob that do a lot of the technical work on the, the Navy ships and, and so on. Mm -hmm. He wanted to be a. Well, he's, he did his thesis and so on. His honours year on on uh, wave powered and and tidal powered turbines and you know, generating alternate energy, if you like. Mm -hmm. But there's no work in it. Mm -hmm. to, you know, this at this stage, anyhow. So he ended up having to take a job, you know, a job, any job, and he's he's done very very well with with that. Um, and Joe's a snowboarder in Austria. Wow. <laughs> he's, he, we've given up saying he's deferring his university after eight years or nine years, I think it is now. So It's just an adventure or like his dad. So he's, yeah, well, every now and then when I sort of say, Joe, it's about time you did something. <laughs> well, that, he says, but dad. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so he, he runs a, a restaurant, or he manages a restaurant in, in St Anton. 
um, or the back end of a restaurant, all the cooking and you know, provisioning and, and all that side of it. And um, and it starts work at three in the afternoon, so he snowboards until three and mm -hmm. comes down to work on his snowboard and mm -hmm. then he knocks off at one in the morning or something and, and goes home, has a few hours sleep and gets up and goes snowboarding again. <laughs> <laughs> Found his passion, so that's important. Mm, yeah, okay. Yeah. And, when, and where, yeah. where have your travels taken you then in the last 34 years since you've been back in terms of your sailing and how you've... Well, just in, in terms of, of sailing, when um, Mary died of breast cancer in um, 2003, mm. so I took the boys and we pissed off, left all the sad people behind mm. and went sailing. We, we um, took a year off school and went to New Caledonia and Vanuatu and mm -hmm. so I had a, a wonderful time up there and the kids spent a lot of time just meeting other kids. Yeah. From and, and I you know, the education and the the, the experiences they had there um, were were way better than a year in school. Mm. And um, and then we, we sailed back and then they finished school and so on and uh, um, as far as Sagan goes, I've only we still sort of sail on and off, but I'm finally now going again. I'm going sailing, but I don't have a, an end point. It's mm. just going sailing till I've had enough. Mm. So, so this is great. So, nice yeah. nice mm. schedule. And... Mm, right. right, that's it. So I can spend a month in Port Davy and a month in Macquarie Harbour if I want to, and mm -hmm. just as I say, my my um, immediate sort of long term destination is the islands off the east end of New Guinea, mm -hmm. um, but. The big sea has, you know, maybe I well, don't make plans too far anymore. Mm. But um, yeah, but in the interim, I've been um, skippering a, a a yacht, a forty foot leopard catamaran, mm -hmm. for a mob called Reef Life Survey, which is started up by a mate of mine, and we've been diving and counting fish, and if you like, in simple terms, identifying and counting fish on fifty meter transects set on multiple locations, thousands of locations all around the world and re repeating them mm -hmm. um, on a, whenever possible, if you like, um, depending on their, their location. Some are easier to repeat than others. And, uh, and monitoring what's happening to the fishes and the reefs of the world, um, mainly concentrated around Australia, but all the way across, you know, in, I think there are 40 different countries wow. uh, around the world. Um, and getting a really good picture of, of how the, the seas are changing. And the data is just collected objectively. There's no, no one knows what it's going to show until you do analysis of it. Mm -hmm. And it's open source. Um, so it's anybody can look up reef life survey and, and see the counts of the, the fish, what fish is where and, and, and so on if you like. Um, how many and how it's changing or whatever. And, and a lot of researchers are now using that database to to then investigate, you know, how things are changing and and, uh, and what's what's happening out there. Mm -hmm. um, but as well as that, for every area, you can go onto that reef, onto that website, and you say, I'm going to go to, you know, um, this area of Tasmania. So it, you can see all the different species of fish that have ever been recorded here, mm -hmm. their size distribution and, and abundance and, and so on. Um, and there are also identification kits, so you can identify them. So if you see a fish when you're diving, you can come up and you can look at and you can find out what that fish is and, mm -hmm. and so on. So, yeah, it's, it's some contribution to understanding mm. what's changing in the, in the marine side of the world mm -hmm. um, that uh, I just feel is, is a useful contribution to mm. it. No one seems to be taking any notice of the harm that's being caused. But or the you know the changes if you like that have been caused, but um, at least you can document it. You can know what's happening, and and uh, we've got data and facts to, mm. to base management around, and and it does certainly help in the in the establishment of marine protected areas and and justification for them because it shows unequivocally that marine protected areas are way 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 more biodiverse, you know, greater abundances and. Mm. And sizes and, and they're not so, picked yeah. off and cleaned out and they're protected and they were just to yeah. exist and evolve and yeah and and they then supply the surrounding areas with like areas adjacent to 
marine protected areas that are of a sufficient size and are policed and are you know, properly managed, areas adjacent to them have got way, way better fish, if you like, mm. fish stocks for the fishery, which we always have to look mm. after and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, it's just good yeah. for everybody. Yeah, yeah, so there's a, there's a win-win-win sort of situation, except the fishermen seem to think that it's stealing their God-given property. Yeah, so, it's yeah. a funny way of looking at it. We're, we're all on this earth for a short time, but you know, yeah. for future generations, you, some resources, once they're gone, they're gone. I mean, the yeah. Jordan Pine's a good example of mm. if you clean it out, you know, it can take hundreds, if not thousands of years to come back. Yeah, if at yeah. all, if you're not careful. Yeah, well, that's the other thing. As the forest changes, the rainforest stops to stops being a rainforest, if you like. And mm. then once you look at where there's been fire, the eucalypts dominate. Mm. And once you've got a eucalypt dominated um, vegetation, uh, who knows how long it will take to revert back to rainforest, if, mm. if at all, because the eucalypts are so um, superior at competing. If mm. you know. Mm. Mm. Okay, and um, I mean, in terms of the people listening to this, and given the the, the years you've spent in Tasmania, what what are some of your favourite spots in terms of Tasmanian cruising? We might get it as a secret, so no one else turns up. <laughs> <So> <laughs> we turned up in rural well, <laughs> well, one of the things, if you, you um, to some degree, if if the Place, the wild places, if you like, aren't used, then the politicians are justifying it as a, a reason to develop them. So, right. that, you know, you can bring in, you know, so it's, it's a very delicate sort of thing as to whether you overuse, you have too many boats. Like in Port Davie, it's one of obviously my favourite places, mm. but once there are more than 10 or 15 yachts in the whole port, you can't get an anchorage to yourself. You, know? mm. you have to share it with somebody else, you know. <laughs> yes. and, uh, and that you know, when in those places is um, uh, it's crowded, you know, but uh, then they bring in a boat every now and then that's got 70 passengers, and it's unbelievable the impact of all those people. You know, just they want to walk to the top of the hill, 70 people walking up and down, see what that does to a muddy track, mm. you know, yeah, um, yeah, or or you know, you're having a quiet sort of morning paddling the kayak, and then these rubber you know, zodiacs go roaring past backwards and forwards and yeah and whatever and and uh, so yeah but you know port davy is is absolutely special it's it's um it's uh one of the few places where you can be for a month and apart from during the the, the, the sort of summer season you can be there for a month and probably have no one else mm. turn up but no roads in there no phone coverage no, no. just just solitude yeah yeah, completely, mm -hmm. and um, and really just wild scenery. There's no, there's evidence everywhere of, of the changes brought by fire, based by the Aboriginal people who yeah. traditionally burnt it, um, uh, because they travelled there, and the easiest way to travel through rainforest is to burn it down and walk in button grass. Mm. You know? um, so uh, um, over the thousands of years, they the the ways they travel. They, they patch burn and so on so that there are there are button grass valleys and, and cleared ridges but then there's also natural fire and then there's also fire that was lit in the earlier days by the woodcutters or the fishermen or whatever mm -hmm. um, and the evidence of them is that the rainforest stops and you know there's a, a slope that's that's um, scrubby and, and whatever where the fires mm. it takes so many hundred years for it to regenerate it's just way back again yeah there's virtually yeah. no soil there mm -hmm. um yeah but anyhow, so it's a it's a it's a very stark um wild landscape mm. um, and magic contrasting colors with the black water and the white quartzite and mm. some of the oldest rocks in the world these rocks are these old quartzites wow uh, they're 14, 1400 million years old wow that's amazing mm. there's a there's a beach on the Maybe the northeastern side of Admiral Hill. Yep. And it's white, white stones. Yeah. There, it's, it's white, white, not yellow, oh. white. And the, the sand's white, white. It's yep. incredible. Yep, yep. Um, oh, the name's just skipped off the tip of my tongue at the moment. It's something, something like by Morris Beach, but it's, um, yeah, anyhow, it's just a perfect crescent of white. Yeah, and they were really flat, round stones yep. Yep. skimming across the water. Yep, that's yeah. it. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Wow, magical. Yeah. Yeah. 
Well, and what what else have we got? What else have we got to share? Or anything else you want to touch on or mention or talk about? I haven't asked you about. Um, well, it's just one of those things where, um, uh, you know, when you ask and prompt a question, it's uh, it, it sort of sets a flow going. But um, yeah, now I, I think I guess what I'm doing at the moment um, is I've reached an age where I don't need and a situation in life where I don't need any more money. Mm-hmm. Um, and the most precious thing now is, is health and time. Mm. And I just sort of thought a couple of years ago, I thought, well, what are the things I want to do that if I don't do now, I won't ever be able to do? And it's go sailing. It's mm. what I wanted to do, you know, go sailing without an endpoint, just cruise. Mm-hmm. And so that's, uh, yeah, if I don't do it now, it's never going to happen. Mm. So that's what I'm, I'm doing, and it's yeah, it's, it's a lovely way to to see and and stop and look at all the places I've sailed past in the future, in the past, but you know, just slowly work my my way around the coast yeah. of Tassie and the coast of Australia, and, mm, and not hurry mm. and not not beat to windward. Which <laughs> <laughs> we're about to do tonight, we're here to Fort Day, we're on the schedule. <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, that's, that's fantastic, Derek. I mean, it's, I mean it's, congratulations again being at this point where you, you, know, you prioritise that and you can do that and you have the opportunity to do that. But yeah. equally, for a lot of people, if you put the steps in place, it might take a year or two or three to get there, five, you can get there. And cruising doesn't have to be as expensive as you may think, and it's a, it costs a lot less than living on land. Especially it's if you take care of your vessel as you yeah. go along, yeah. Yeah. you know, yeah. it's quite surprising how cost efficiently you can travel mm-hmm. the world, really. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and uh, the, the thing I love about this sailing life is that you never really know what's going to happen that day. So every <laughs> so day true. is unknown, yeah. and, and there's a massive influence of the wind and the weather mm. on the day-to-day life that you can't control in anything like the way you can. I mean, you can be lying there at night, you know, sort of wondering if the anchor's going to drag as 60 knot squalls go over the head, you know, one, yeah. one time. And, and another time you can be in mirror calm and, and you know, in the same place and mm. watch the reflections of, of things in the, in the water. You know. um, and... Uh, you can be here for five days by yourself, and next thing you know, you've got a seventy-foot boat <laughs> wanting to tie up beside you, and and you just never know what's going to happen. And and that to me, at home, you know, am I going to go gardening or am I going to go down the bush, you know, for a walk or am I yeah, take the dog to the beach? Really, you know? isn't it? Yeah. And and there's so little of that that unknown, whereas every day is is an adventure. Mm. Mm. Yeah, it's so true. I mean, there's so many things that happen to us along the way, and. You, know, you, you wouldn't dream. You don't look for them. Happens. You don't dream of them, but they happen. Yeah. You know, I say I'm not looking for new material, but it just keeps turning up in terms yeah. of yeah. stories to share and things to talk about. Yeah. So something is like that. Um, even, even in fair weather, this things happen. So yeah, or nothing happens. Mm. Yeah. And that's, and that's Which is just bliss. Well. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Well, it's been a real pleasure to, to meet you, Derek, and thank you for putting aside the time this morning in an impromptu way to have a chat. On, on board this beautiful yacht cigar, incredible, such a warm, homely, comfortable feel. The timbers just it's beautiful. Yeah, I'm just looking at these. These were given to me by an old doctor, father of a girlfriend of mine actually. But they're off an old Scottish square rigger mm-hmm. that he had he had for 50 years or something, and and hadn't got the boat to put them in, so he gave them to me when, when I was launching. Yeah, but thank you for for. If you like the opportunity, but you, you've you put out the, the podcasts you put out are inspirational to a lot of people around the world, I'm sure. Mm, and um, thank you. Yeah, and it gives us a connection again in some degree where with other people you, know, mm. that you haven't met yet. But you know, you'd be surprised the number of people I've chatted to in Anchorages who listen to those podcasts so keep them coming okay thank you thanks for the thanks for the the prompt and the inspiration and uh, and yeah i, I mean and, and the i the more I, more i sell the more i meet people great stories to share and i've just got to do a mm. better job of capturing those along the way and then when i get into it again get them get them uploaded so I'll, this is just taking the ground yeah. after chatting to you i think i think actually i don't have prepared this at all i seem to grab my ipad which is what we're using right now mm. um instead of setting up microphones and 
sound mixer and that kind of stuff because the sound's pretty good on, on the iPad these days. And well, it's better than no sound. So, I, I do yeah. remember um, the first time I came across you, I was um, driving down to pick up an engine motor for a water maker from where well, early, no, from Port Douglas down to long way south. So I was driving, and at that stage, you didn't have the sound worked out properly. Yeah. I couldn't listen to your prop. I could hear the responses to your questions, but I couldn't hear the, your questions. Right. As I was as I was driving, you know, because I can't remember what sort of vehicle it was in. Yeah. But, you know, it was one of those scenarios. I was like, speak up. Just couldn't get it up loud enough. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I've got to, yeah. But you sorted that now. That's yeah, I was, I was probably 100 episodes, well, mm. maybe 60 episodes into it, I bought a, a better mixer because mm. those the microphones are really directional, mm. which is great, but if somebody just turns their head away slightly, it can drop the volume by you know, mm. 60, 70 percent, and mm. you've got to do a lot of manual mm. adjustment afterwards, which is, um, yeah, you, that's know, what you can just record a podcast and it's ready yeah. to go, or well, you can have that, and that can mm. take hours of editing just mm. for an hour of content. So it's, yeah, yeah. it's good to mm. not have those issues because. I hate it when you're listening to something that's up and down and up and down and you turn mm. your volume up and you turn it back down. Mm. Mm. So, yeah, we're, I think yeah, it's good feedback. No, it's, all, it's all good. Uh, but, uh, great. Yeah. Well, thanks for thanks for letting us raft up. And, uh, it's and, uh, been a great pleasure. And being invited over for dinner last night. Well, yeah, that was good. Terrific, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah the conversation. Excellent. Yeah, you've got some, a wonderful crew there. Yeah, and a great bunch. We're yeah. well, looking forward to Continue on to Port Davey over tonight tonight and getting there tomorrow morning at first light hopefully and, and um which is a special place to stop on the way back around the mm. highlights. So yeah. yeah, and I'm sure um, I'm sure our paths will cross again in the future. Probably will. Yeah. Excellent. Anyhow, I'll be listening to that. Yeah, well <laughs> great. Cheers, Thanks, then, Thanks Derek. It's been a real pleasure. Yeah, same. Thank you and all the best with your travellers and mm. and um, this is Cigar so definitely that forever boat that you know, you keep forever and until you so that last year was just... Yeah, yeah. Well, just, use, use building methods that are hundreds of years old. Mm. Should do. Mm. Materials should do. Fantastic. Mm.